Okay. How are you now? Good. Who is on the line? Hello, I am Dr. Prabhakar Nayar. You just Hello sir, hello sir, Prabhakar Nayar sir. Namaskaram. Namaskaram, namaskaram. So, happy to see you again after a long 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 period. Thank you for joining the seminar. If you stay for the seminar and uh, you know we can connect again because the only thing that I'm facing a challenge now is I cannot see you but you can see me. Yeah. So um if I have to disconnect again it might delay the start, right? So yeah, that um any anyway it's uh, nice that I could see you. And oh, thank you. Yeah, I, we we are proud that uh, I mean, you are in a very high position after a long period and an expert in the field, isn't it? Thank you very much. Your guidance, inspiration, your teaching all help me to um, go through the whole phases of life and uh, be what I am today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I just wanted uh, to see you and uh, listen to you for some time. That is why I made it a point to connect to this uh, meet. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you can uh, connect uh, with me through email, I will be more than happy to connect with you. Dr. Subodh has my email. Yeah. Uh, I can share, sir. I can share. My, my email is very simple. srpnoyar at gmail.com. That's all. Very simple. SRP? NAOYAR. At gmail dot com. Okay. I will reach out to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sanan, how are you? Sanan, get on. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm talking to Vishnu. Well, few years senior to Mahare. Sanan, get on. I think it is mute. Okay. Mahare, Vishnu. Vishnu, then he is a senior. Ah, uh, Mahare, do you remember me? Yeah, yeah, I remember you very well. At the moment you speak, now I can remember. <laughs> Well, I don't know what I'm Okay. Well, I'm the senior. Ah, I'm a In uh, Madre Kamraj? No, no, no. Uh, near to Madre, Kalashil University. I, I will I see. So I retired and. Uh, and uh, Excellent. My goodness. I remember you very well. <laughs> okay. Good that uh, we are to meet after, uh, online after a long time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Dr. Subodh has my contact. So if you uh, please collect my email ID, 
you know we can stay okay. in touch you know yeah okay okay we have a lot okay, of uh, sure. information that we can exchange yeah yeah sure Dr. Subod? Yes, sir. Um, a couple of my batchmates are saying they are unable to join the link. Um, okay. Una unable to log in. No, sir. Um, maybe I can share the link again. Can you send to them? Uh, Uh, google.com that uh, link what you send anyway I, they have texted to me so I will send them um, So, Dr. Subod, whenever you are ready, you can let me know. Yeah, yeah. Radhi, Radhika Mada has joined just now. Yeah, Radhika and a um, couple of my batchmates, um, this is Ananda Lakshmi and um, Dr. Suresh Nair, I think they are all logging in. Okay. So, Bishar, shall we start? Yeah, you can start. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, now I invite Ms. Arpeda, who is our research scholar, to formally introduce Professor Mahadevan. Arpeda, please. Good morning, all. As a part of the 50th anniversary celebrations of the Department of Physics, University of Kerala, we have organized an invited talk by Professor Mahadevan K. Iyer, Professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, University of Texas, Dallas, USA. Dr. Iyer is also our renowned alumnus. He, he has graduated with MSc in Physics from the Department of Physics, University of Kerala in 1983. He has completed his entrance in Microelectronics from IIT Kharagpur in 1984. 
Then he started working for ISRO Satellite Center in Bangalore. And a few years later, he moved to Lakhdara University of Technology in UK for doing his PhD. He was awarded British Council Fellowship and Sponsorship by GE for his PhD work in developing very high-speed chip-to-chip interconnection technologies for multi-chip modules. Dr. Iyer has 35 years of R&D experience in semiconductor and electronics, including Texas Instruments, Infineon Technologies, and General Electrics. He has taught and led innovative and academic research at Georgia Institute of Technology, USA, National University of Singapore, Institute of Microelectronics in Singapore, and is currently associated with the University of Texas. Recently, he was the Vice President of Global Technology Development and Manufacturing of Texas Instruments. He was honored with Jack Tilby Award for Design and Technology Innovation by Texas Instruments in December 2018. He has published more than 150 research papers, has written two book chapters, won several best paper awards, and has 28 US patents to his credit. It's our privilege to have Professor Mahadevan K. Iyer on this occasion to deliver a talk on electronic devices and system integration, trends and challenges. With great pleasure, we welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thanks very much for um, having me for the seminar um, in connection with the 50th anniversary celebration of the Department of Physics, University of Kerala. Dr. Subodh, I believe I can start off the seminar, right? Please, sir, please, you can start. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, um, Dr. C.B., Dr. Subodh, for organizing the seminar, and uh, Ms. Arpita for giving the introduction. I'm honored and um, humbled to be back with the Department of Physics, University of Kerala, after a gap of about 38 years. I think I did my math correctly. So, um, you know, it has been a long journey since I left university campus at Karyavatam. And um, at the outset, let me start off by expressing deep sense of appreciation and gratitude to all faculty members of Department of Physics, University of Kerala for laying the foundations in physics and applied electronics for me and my batchmates as well. When uh, I was interacting with my batchmates, some of uh, my batchmates also have joined the seminar. You know, when we were connecting last week about this seminar topic, um, collectively, we are acknowledging what our professors and faculty members have taught us, have laid the foundations, and shaped our career to be where we are today. Humble pranams and namastes to all of them. And that continues, and that goes to the rest of the faculty members who are there today and also who have filled the gap between 1983 and 2021. It's decades of teaching physics through many faculty members have elevated the Department of Physics in University of Kerala campus to a place where you guys are today. And I also want to take this opportunity to personally thank Professor Rao, Professor P.B. Rao, whom I got in touch with a couple of weeks ago and um, so for suggesting my name to this seminar and Dr. Subodh for coordinating the seminar with me to make this happen today and all my batchmates who have joined, all my seniors, some of them spoke to me a couple of minutes ago before the start of the seminar. A big salute to all of them as well. Um, Dr. Subodh and I were working on the dates for the seminar. I gave a couple of dates to have the seminar and then uh, he picked January 20th. I do not know what made him to choose, but there are many things that happened coincidentally First and foremost is uh, India won against Australia in their test match series, which I watched until 2 a.m. my time this morning, which was like 1.30 p.m. for you guys yesterday. You know, because I'm a cricket fan, I continue to play cricket, even now I play cricket. So that's one thing that I thought, you know, Subodh, Dr. Subodh has selected the day nicely for this day to celebrate with the cricket team. And secondly, um, the President of United States the new president is going to take charge in the next couple of hours, few hours, I would say, over here. It's uh, 10, 10, 15 p.m. here, probably in the morning, as soon as we get into the morning time, we will have the uh, 
a new president taking charge as well. So it's still January 20th for you guys. So wonderful day for having the seminar. Thanks, Dr. Subodh, for coordinating this event. So leaving cricket and politics aside, let me get to the topic, what we wanted to cover today and what I wanted to share with you. And um, I would take the first few slides to walk through where the technology and applications and trends in electronic system integration are and how we ended up in where we are today and what technologies and what system integration technologies have shaped up to have the smartphone in our, in our hand today, have the high-end computing devices and what you see around in the last three decades and when we and my batchmates and my seniors left the campus, there were no emails, there were no smartphones, there were no cell phones. And in one way, we are blessed that we travel with the technology advancements over the last 30, 35 years. I remember 8086 microprocessor in our lab in physics department, which was one of the first microprocessors that came up, Intel came up with, which was a 32-bit microprocessor chip. Today, we are talking about 512 gigabit of memory chips inside your iPhone 12 Max Pro with one fourth or one by eighth of the size of a laptop. All right, so that is the level of integration that has happened in the system, just to give you some example. What I intend to cover once I go through the technology application trends is to give you what exactly is happening on the system on chip. And there is a complementing technology that's developed now is system in package. And what are the research opportunities there? What are the R&D challenges? And what is in there for physics? That is a key that probably I always look back and see what, what exactly is the fundamental behind that. And finally, I end up in saying that it is the physics. So physics lays the foundation. I can confidently say having traveled through the technology all, all through the last 30, 35 years since I graduated, Physics is ahead of us. Physics is leading the path. And physics is behind us supporting us also. To understand the functionalities, to understand the failures, to understand the advancements, physics plays a critical role. I, and I don't have any hesitation in saying that it is physics that is laying, laying the foundation. So I'm, I'm in, in one way, I'm blessed that I took physics as the fundamental for specializing on that and build career around physics, leading to microelectronics and devices and system integration, electronic system integration. And that physics with applied electronics helped in shaping up the career as well. Again, thank you very much, all the faculty members and professors who taught us in those days the fundamentals and made it a career for me and our batchmates. I will close the seminar by giving some recent work and opportunities ahead as well. So what exactly is happening in the world right now? Semiconductors and system a snapshot. If you really look at 2009 and 2019, the worldwide semiconductor devices sales has gone from $220 billion to $410 billion. It's almost a 2x growth. And I say semiconductor devices that encompasses the entire gamut of thing from simple amplifiers, oscillators to high-end processors and systems, system on chip. Supporting the semiconductor devices, you have hundreds of companies, system companies. When I say system companies, Apple is a system company. Samsung is a system company, right? They all make electronic products and systems. Then you have semiconductor device companies, material suppliers, equipment suppliers, fabs, foundries, assembly houses, electronic manufacturing solution providers. So you have hundreds and hundreds of companies who are making this happen on a daily basis. For example, Texas Instruments, the company that I was working for until December, they, they produce 40 billion units per year, 40 billion, B as in boy, right? That is the amount of devices a company is producing today, just to give you an example. And where are these devices going? If you really look at what is ahead of us, let's not talk about the past a lot, let's talk about the future. The next 10 years, you will have more and more inter internet connected things. You have heard the word IoT. What is IoT? I mean, in simpler language, Internet of Things. What things? It's nothing but sense, compute, and communicate. You have sensors, you have computing systems, you need to compute, you need to communicate. And that is IoT today. That is expected to exceed 100 billion units by 2025 in the next four years. 
folks are moving to automotive driving autonomous driving meaning unmanned driving autonomous driving coupled with wireless connectivity and ambient intelligence when you walk into your car the car will welcome you mr mahadevan or dr mahadevan all right and then you have an ambient intelligence there you are wirelessly connected you have to have an autonomous driving today we are at level 3 3.5 leading to level 4 the target is level 5 where you will have a completely autonomous driving you don't have to touch the steering wheel you get into the car the car drives of its own the destination is set you can program the destination if you are going to work on a daily basis the same route the car takes you so that is where we are heading towards in the next 5 to 7 years industrial automation factory automation there are lots of sensors being applied into factories low voltage high voltage we are talking about greater than 600 volts silicon carbide devices gallium nitride devices 3 5 compound devices i'm throwing these words because they are all physics fundamental physics of electronics right and we are talking about higher and higher power kilowatts to megawatts of power in addition to all the hardware that i talked about you have a humongous growth in the computing side and software everyone talks about ai and ml and all edge computing artificial intelligence machine learning precisely the ai will not stand alone unless the hardware is capable of doing that software cannot do anything software cannot deliver anything unless you have a hardware supporting that and vice versa so the next wave is actually the semiconductor and system integration opportunities so and that's what exactly i'm planning to cover in the next 40 minutes so having introduced you where we are heading towards in terms of integration electronic devices and systems is in the center of a new era we have internet of things we have 5g we have been talking about 1g 2g 3g 4g and 5g when i left the campus university campus we have, we knew only 1g which was acceleration due to gravity that was the only g to be honest that we were we were aware of and all the g's came after that all right so you have wcdma protocol which came in as a, a 3g then you have 4g long term evolution 4g lte now we are talking about 5g sub 6 gigahertz and millimeter wave 5g applications right so tremendous growth in device technology system integration packaging multi chip modules all integrating and that that is exactly where we are driving towards in system integration so what are the key drivers for the system integration you need system to be compact you want the smartphones to be smaller and smaller you want more data speed in that you want audio and video to be uplinked and downlinked as fast as possible when you want to send it to your friend the friend says my video is hanging it's not that's not the problem because the problem is there's too much of communication and too much of data download and upload happening at the same time simultaneously you have to handle you take a 5g 5g phone today you have four cameras i mean so four antennas there these are mimo antennas right so you have uh, wifi you have bluetooth you have gps you have cellular right and each one of them have got different frequency frequency bandwidths bandwidth requirements and miniaturization you want that to be in a very compact place and that is exactly the challenge that we are facing from system integration point of view industrial automation i talked about automotive medical and healthcare i will give one example of each one of them just to give you a feel of where we are heading towards as i said iot devices connections by 2025 greater than 5 billion units will be shipped in the next 4 years and where are these devices going to be used connecting cities if you want to connect from tambano to kariyavattam you know in the past there were only microwave link equipments right now we are coming back to macro cells small cells pico cells femto cells what are these these are where you can connect from your university department vicinity to department i mean to the university campus campus to kariyavattam town you know i'm throwing the examples what you can understand and gariyottam town to connect to tambano station right so that is exactly the type of link connections that we are building and the type of devices that you are looking for a 50 meter connectivity within the department 
the devices need to be much smaller because your units are going to be smaller compared to your microwave link, link equipment. So the diversity of the needs are also varying. So accordingly, you have to really look, and for, look for different types of technologies to get this integration done. I talked about cities. I'll give you one or two examples and move on, but these slides will be available for you to come back to me if you have any questions later. But another important thing is mobile health, wearable electronics, gateways, remote patient monitoring. Okay, and then uh, connected industrial, we talked about process equipment, monitoring, communication between equipment in a huge factory. That's going to be wireless. And that's going to be through wireless sensors. Connected building, right? I mean, so it's the, the, diverse the, diverse, the diversity in the application is increasing. Now, if you look at 5G, I briefly talked about it. This is just to give you an example of where 5G is heading towards. Last year, um, 37 million units were shipped, expected to ship. And 2020, uh, we expected to have about uh, 199 million units in 2020. But because of the COVID restrictions, you know, and, and all, all the associated manufacturing challenges that the companies faced, uh, there was a shipment of about 125 million units. But the projection is doubling and tripling in the years to come. Why is that? Because everyone wants high speed, high bandwidth, peak data rates, uh, ideal uplink forms and downlink waveforms. And last but not the least, everyone would prefer the best sort of communication in an integrated and miniaturized way. Right? And here is an example of the cellular modems that were released in the last one and a half years between Intel, MediaTek, HiSilicon, Qualcomm, Samsung. They all released these cellular modems for 5G execution. That gives you a clear idea about how much of push is coming in from the 5G portfolio point of view. Industrial automation. I briefly talked about factory automation, just, which is just one example. And why is this important? Because you have wireless connectivity needed. You have IoT sensors. And most of these machines are connected with sensors. And these sensors are going to be enabling communication between equipment, communication to a critical point in a factory where you have a centralized processing for the entire factory that needs to be kept in place. And collaborative robots. So we have robots. Now we call cobots. So if you see, sir, I don't know whether my cursor is seen there, but um, if at the center of the picture I see a factory there, I put there as cobot. They are called collaborative robots. Robots are going to collaborate with their sensors and artificial intelligence and machine learning that we are going to teach these robots to communicate wirelessly. And, and the computer vision and artificial intelligence is another enabler. And the workers in the factory will have wearable electronics and where which they can communicate between machine and man, man-machine interaction or man-machine interfacing. One additional example I want to show here is medical devices and healthcare. In the context of uh, what we are seeing today in the pandemic world and coronavirus attacking, and we are trying to get vaccinated as fast as possible. But here is the, the devices that have gone in, into the medical world. 3.7 million medical devices in use today, connecting to monitoring and various parts of the body. 97% of Wi-Fi adoption rates in hospitals. 10% of medical devices enabled with Wi-Fi. So this is as of last year. And inside the body and outside the body, there are lots of medical devices, electronic devices. We call in vivo devices inside the body and in vitro devices for outside the body. And outside the body wirelessly, the devices are connected wirelessly to the family doctor. You can connect to the doctor in charge in the hospitals. Those are all happening today. But where are we heading towards in the next 10 years? Hospitals and home care, prevention of disease. If we can identify identification of risk by collecting genomic information, and there is a huge discipline that have emerged, which is the bioinformatics. And the amount of data that has been collected from human beings based on their genome, genomic data compilation, there, is, there are strong possibilities of early diagnosis of diseases like even cancer which would save the human being in a big way. And coupled with these requirements, you have the digitization, like what we talk, talked about IoT, 5G, uh, mobile health solution. So if somebody is jogging and uh, 
while you are jogging, your blood pressure and heart rate and all can be monitored today. And it can be wirelessly connected to the family doctor. So as long as you wear a jacket with the right devices, you are, you are ready to go. And as we get old, we are all getting older. I mean, at least our group, we are getting older. So individual responsibility of make, taking some self-measurements, self-diagnosis. So point of care to your bedside. In the Western world, in the United States, as we get old, you know, we go to old age homes and then how do we treat ourselves? You know, if you are not able to move, you have to have some sort of mechanisms where you will have the capability of self-diagnosis and then you press a button or a sensor that will give the data wirelessly connecting to your doctor, right? So the, I just wanted to give you a feel of where electronic devices and systems are used in the mobile field, I mean the medical field. Very interesting area on automotive electronics. This is the uh, future of uh, next 10 years. There's a lot happening inside the automotive. The car that we used in 1980s is not the car that we are using today, right? I mean, if you really go in for a high-end car, you have all this, whatever I have shown here in different color, is just to give you a feel of the number of sensors. The moment you have sensors, you have control circuits, you have feedback circuits, you have connectivity circuits associated with the sensors, right? Because you, a sensor alone cannot communicate or compute. You have to have the rest of the electronics with that. So precisely what I'm showing here is just to give a feel of how many sensors are there inside a high-end automotive car today. If you go in for a mid-end car, you will see at least 50 to 60% of the sensor systems that I'm showing here. Interestingly, I want to tell a story. I mean, I, this happened recently here. You know, somebody went for a December 31st party. You know, what, what did the person do on December 31st night? You know, he was on alcohol. I mean, a little bit of excess alcohol went in and he had a remote control in his hand. And the remote control, when he pressed it, the car did not open. Ideally, the car should open when he, when he wants to go out. The car did not open because it, the remote sensor sensed that the alcoholic content in his body and prevented the car from opening. So that is a wireless connection between the remote control of the car and the car, sensing the alcohol content inside the body. And this guy threw out, got angry. You know, how can I get on, how can I be, not be getting into my own car Right? So he threw the remote control on, this, on the street in anger and the uh, alarm went on because there is an emergency alarm inside the remote control. If you, are, if you are under danger, you can press the emergency alarm and it gets connected to your nearest police station. So this guy, out of anger, he threw the remote control on the street and then the fire alarm, I mean the uh, emergency alarm went on and he got connected to the police station and the police came and arrested him. So this is something like, you know, the technology can be a little bit nasty at some time because, you know, something that you invent for your good can put you in some danger. So he spent this new year in the police station. So the reason I'm saying is we are at a place and we are moving in a direction where we are trying to bring in technology in your hand. And uh, what I would suggest is use the technology carefully. That's it. All right. Um, so where are we heading towards? Wireless intelligent edge. This is the key keyword for this coming decade. When we are talking about 5G execution, the next three, four years, 5G will be more on an execution mode. We are going to implement more and more devices, more and more phones. IEEE had organized a seminar, a summit, 6G summit last year, year before last, 2019. You know, so that's where uh, I saw this interesting slide I wanted to share. Um, 5G, 6G, 6G from communication point of view, internet of things and artificial intelligence. So you are trying to bring in communication, sensing and computing into a totally new domain. And what enables to make that happen is what is at the bottom of the slides where we talk about physics, materials, electronics, devices, sensors. Without that, you are not having any hardware. So that is the fundamental elements. You have to have some reliability for these devices and systems to work. You have to have privacy. You need to keep security and interoperability. Your software, hardware, architectures, and services, that gives you the flexibility. And then the upper tier is where you go for ultra fast communication, low latency, high bandwidth, connected devices, sensing based operations, knowledge driven, automated, unmanned, all those differentiating factors. So this is 
I just wanted to show one slide as a part of uh, end of towards my end of my introduction, and I wanted to say that this is where the world is heading towards from system integration point of view. Now let's get to the fundamentals: semiconductor devices and system integration trends. So systems can be integrated on a single chip in a semiconductor chip today. If you take a smartphone, more, most of you have cell, cell phones and smartphones. We didn't call smartphones to start with until it became smart. Now it is smart. So now we call it as smartphones. But the smartphones, if you see, look at the antenna section and RF front end modules, right? So you have uh, the LNA, power amplifier, switches, filters uh, on the uh, receiver side, on the, the power amplifier on the transmitter side, right? You have the entire bar filters, soft filters, you, you name it. All of them are trying to be integrated on a single chip. And here we are at a place where system on chip is becoming more and more complex because of the design that has to go in and the fabrication and the cost involved to get this high complex system. And if it fails, you're going to throw the chip, right? And coupled with that, you have the interesting vectors of additional base materials, like typical chips are made out of silicon. You start with a single crystal silicon and you have layers and layers deposited over it. You make transistors out of it. You have billions of transistors integrated today. But when it comes to multifunctional systems, what I mean by multifunctional system is if you have a gallium nitride for high mobility device, a gallium arsenide power amplifier, and you are trying to use a silicon carbide device for high thermal conductivity, I'm trying to use all the physics behind that. And I will cover that in a minute, how, you, how the physics is getting connected here. All right, so the, the integration has become a little bit challenged on chip, and that is where system and package come in, where you can have modules or multi-chip modules. Okay, and I will cover that a little bit more in, in, as we get into the details. Now, as I said, the summary here is we are driving from single functional ICs to multifunctional ICs and multifunctional system integration needs. That could be a combination of digital and wireless, high voltage and high power, mix of low voltage and low power, sensors and biochips. For example, you have lab on a chip today, which means um, the input for the chip is your blood and the output is digital waveforms. So basically it extracts the DNA from your blood, which is the DNA extraction. It amplifies, it detects, and then it, it will be converted into signals, mixed signals, and where you can get and then convert that into multiplexers and digital waveforms. So precisely it gives you an entire lab, a bio lab on a chip, which is what we call as lab on a chip, DNA lab on a chip, okay? Um, and we are talking about smart sensors, smart everything as we move forward. So if I switch into multifunctional device and system integration needs, R&D challenges and opportunities, what is in there for physics? If I look at system on chip, when we started off digital electronics, digital was digital, analog was analog. Then we said, okay, I can make digital and analog mix together. We can call mix signal. I, I have to have A to D converter, D to A converters. I need logic circuits. I need memory, memory circuits. So then it becomes a challenge in the 90s that folks have started high-end digital chips. I put memory and processor in one chip. I can have a single chip on that. Then advancements in uh, CMOS technologies and bi -CMOS, bipolar CMOS technologies enabled us to get into true mixed signal systems. And RF CMOS technologies in 2000s, early 2000s, helped us to get RF CMOS chips, which means you are trying to get the LNA switches, multiplex, I mean, diplexers and all those things into an RF CMOS IC. Okay, so that is where we are today. I mean, we, we have advanced furthermore, but for the sake of time, I'm trying to give you the fundamentals. But at the very high end, we can say three classification of SOCs, multi-technologies, a combination of digital and RF CMOS, that's a multi-technology, power efficient, technologies. You want optical interconnects. You have laser diodes, photo diode, photo detectors today. Laser diode and photo detectors integrated on one chip with the uh, trans impedance amplifier, photo detectors, I mean, uh, the flop data recovery circuits, CDRs, all of them integrated on single chip. That is a power efficient system on chip. 
then you have high performance system on chip very high end computing right so today's laptop if you take the microprocessors they are operating at 5 gigahertz right 4 to 5 gigahertz speed it dissipates about 100 watts 80 to 100 watts power that they are on actually high performance chip and if you really go in for data center computing very high end computing you are really going in after going after very high uh, computing speed now when you when you invent some new technologies there are always challenges associated with that so if you really look at the technical challenges being addressed design for verification test manufacturability cross talk so what happens as you come in as you pull in more and more functional elements you have traces which are very close on the single chip so what happens your parasitics inductance capacitance resistance that is physics right you bring in coupling noise cross talk noise if your impedance is not matched you have reflection noise those who are working in the RF and microwave area would understand clearly what I'm saying. So as we go in for more and more functional integration on a smaller area, you will be challenged with all these type of noise mechanism. And if you have parasitic inductance and you have multiple transistors switching simultaneously, you have thousands of transistors switching simultaneously, you will have simultaneous switching noise. And as you put more and more functions into the chip, you have to manage the power. You have to take the heat. And what is that? It is physics because it is thermodynamics. You are trying to heat, take the heat out of it. You have to look at the heat and mass transfer. You have to look at high conductivity, thermal conductivity materials that would enable to come in as heat sinks or heat spreaders to take the heat out of these high functionality chips that are dissipating 100 watts of power in maybe 1.5 inch by 1.5 inch area. It's quite humongous stars, right? So that those are some of the Challenges, as I speak, we are trying to address as well. Now, when it comes to system on chip versus system in package, people have not looked at the ability to integrate outside the chip. And that is what companies like Apple, Samsung have done successfully today in making their iPhone 10 and 12 so smart. And, um, and this is getting spread into other areas like automotive as well, how they are able to integrate more more and more electronics, whether it is infot infotainment electronics for uh, automotive, they are all able to do that because of integration on chip and off chip. So I want to spend a little bit of time on off chip because on chip is, is another topic of its own. We can deal with that later if time permits on another day. But I just wanted to connect how physics is helping on the system integration from integration outside the chip. Here is a simple IC package right you have i have shown i'm showing a cross section here let me pause here and uh, ask dr subodh is, is everything okay the audio is coming clear is there anything that sir, yes, it is coming everything is okay you can continue sir please thank you so what i'm showing here is what is highlighted here in the red block here is a single ic and uh, it is attached to a lead frame and it is interconnected to the leads what you are seeing outside you know, in the encapsulated with Texas Instrument block there, what you are seeing as an outside lead is what you are seeing inside. The inside portion of the lead is what is shown here. And that is connected to the chip through a wire, which is what we normally call as wire bond. And then this is encapsulated using an epoxy, which is polymer. And what is shown here in the blue lead color on the cross section are metal leads. And what is shown in the red color is a silicon chip and the silicon is attached to the copper lead through epoxies, adhesives. So what I have introduced here is a silicon, a polymer, a metal, a gold or copper wire for interconnection. So physics, right? So basically you have different materials here. You have polymer interface with metal. You have a polymer interface with silicon. You have a silicon interfacing with uh, adhesive, which is an epoxy, silver filled epoxy. And you have lead frame, which is copper metal pad. So nobody knew that things would get this complex when initially dice devices were made. And then it was encapsulated using polymer more compound. Their packaging, they thought it is nothing. It is just put an encapsulation and ship. And why do you need packaging? You need to protect the device from uh, damage, right? But as the complexity increased, increased, imagine the chip that is sitting at the center is a microprocessor chip which has got about 1,500 input-output pin counts, you have 1,500 interconnections, wire bonds coming in. 
uh, in a dimensions of about say 7 millimeter by 7 millimeter to 8 millimeter by 8 millimeter you have 1500 interconnections coming out and first thing is if you are sending signals in gigahertz you have coupling noise right so you need to figure out how do i minimize the noise how do i minimize the parasitics you put these devices for reliability test. All devices have to go through reliability test, whether it is for spacecraft or military or commercial applications. It only changes in the standards. Military standard 883S, if you use for spacecraft, that has got the most stringent specifications, right? And 883B goes for military, and then you have 883C for commercials, and there are different standards practices. So this, these, temp these devices go for, for example, minus 40, 125 C temperature cycling or minus 65, 150 C temperature cycling for spacecraft or commercial devices. So what happens? You have a polymer and a metal and you have a coefficient of thermal expansion. That is where physics comes in. You are CTE mismatch. Your polymer coefficient of thermal expansion is not matched to your metal. So you will create a delamination where the polymer interface with, lead, with the metal lead. It's delaminating. Okay, so in addition to your electrical noise issue, managing the signal integrity, power integrity analysis, EMI analysis, you have to really look at how do you shield this material if you have a high frequency signal coming out. All right, so electrically. Then you have the thermal challenge. How do I take the heat out of the chip if the heat is dissipating 100 watts? So you need thermal interface materials. Your epoxy is a polymer material, silver filled epoxies. They are not highly thermal conductive material. Your polymer is not a highly thermal conductive material. So how do you uh, take the heat out of this chip before you will get into thermal hotspots and run away inside the chip. So I'm using a simple diagram to explain how complex this packaging has become. Now imagine this chip has, this module has got multi-chip, not one chip. You have a gallium arsenide chip, you have a silicon CMOS chip, you have a gallium nitride chip or a silicon carbide chip. That is where the industry is moving towards. Multifunctional sensitive, then you may have a sensor chip which is ultra sensitive to all these things. Sensitivity, right? So the complexity increases and along with that selection of materials and we call it as co-design. It is typically called as circuit design or IC design in the past. Now the, the thing that is varying now is co-design where you have to really look at electrical aspects, thermal aspects and mechanical aspects. What is that? What do you mean by mechanical aspect? Mechanical aspects can be what creep mechanisms can come in? What is the fatigue of the material? How do you select good CTE matched material? If CT, the coefficient of thermal expansion of these materials are not matched, can I invent some materials that act as a cushion between two dissimilar materials in CTE? For example, uh, polymer, the industry has come up with what we call as underfills. They are filling materials. A silicon has a CTE of uh, three, roughly around three, and uh, PCB or the laminate, what we used uh, to mount these devices on the printer circuit board has a CTE of 17 ppm per degree centigrade. So you have a big mismatch there. So your silicon cannot sit on the directly onto the board. And that's where we come up with filler materials, which has got a CTE of 7 to 8 to 9, so which acts as a cushion so that it will hold there. Now, to minimize the parasitics and electrical issues, Motorola came up in early uh, 90s saying that Okay, let me go through this foil and then come back to that. So here are the challenges I mentioned briefly. You know, you have pin counts increasing, you have frequency, power dissipation, noise immunity, power dissipation, your thicknesses, system level reliability issue, temperature cycling, drop, vibration test, shock test. So whatever you normally do for missiles and spacecrafts, you normally do that for commercial products because you drop your smartphone, right? So there are drop tests. Apple and Samsung would insist that I need the drop test to be like this. It has to pass uh, 20 hertz to 2000 hertz vibration, sign and random. It has to pass the mechanical shock test, right? And then you have environmental reliability test, temperature cycling, thermal shock, high temperature storage life, high temperature operational life test, burn-in test. There's a gamut of tests that we need to do to get these devices packaged and then tested before it comes to you and me. So Motorola came up with the idea of instead of connecting by wire, can I do the flip the device and connect it like a flip chip technology? So they are they call it as this is my active die. I use a solder bomb to connect to my PCB or to the substrate. So what do you get out of it? Because your long wire will have long inductance, capacitance, and resistance. This is a small solder ball. I reduce the parasitics. If I reduce the parasitics, I reduce the noise. Okay, fantastic. So that that solution got 
uh, more acceptable. But this is an expensive technology. This process is not very well accepted in the industry, but those who are really needing for high frequencies, RF millimeter wave, where um, noise immunity is critical, we go for flip chip technology. This is uh, on the right hand side, what I'm saying is today you have memory sticks and memory drive that can go into gigabits of memory, high end of gigabits of memory. That is because you have stacked memory devices, one over the other. You have eight devices today stacked with interfaces. The more complexity you add, the more challenges you face in, in solving the problems as well. But that is the way of life and that is the engineering challenge, right? I mean, you keep on inventing new things and go after the challenges and solve the problems and you learn something and make, make the failure happen fast. Always I believe in that. Make the failure happen faster so that you learn it from them faster and then try to get enough time to make corrective actions and implement. So here is a snapshot of what all things happened over the last 15, 20 years in system integration from packaging point of view, right? There was industry push from getting green substrates, green underfill materials. These underfill materials are nothing but again to minimize the CTE mismatch between silicon and substrate. What do you mean by green substrate? There was a push towards lead free. Uh, all the solders are lead based, right? So there was a push towards, hey, lead is not good for environment, so we need to go for lead free. So now the lead based, lead tin based solder has been replaced by lead tin copper. So the lead tin copper brings in a new set of challenges because that's a new set of material for electronics industry. And in the last 15, 20 years, people have overcome the issues associated with that. And there's a lot of publications related to that as well. Here I'm showing some typical cases of cracks in solder joint. You know, those who are working in material science would understand how the delamination happens, how cracks can happen and what initiates cracks and how cracks can propagate. So when I see a simple example, I put here impedance control from electrical point of view, low moisture absorption from material point of view, alternate plate plating finishes from metallurgy point of view, glass transition temperature from physics and chemistry point of view. So you are really looking at a very interdisciplinary subject matter as we move into the, this decade. One, one field of expertise is not good enough. You have to really have a pool of engineers and scientists sitting in the room really looking at this system integration from diverse angle and say, okay, we fixed one, but we haven't fixed the other two, right? And I think that is where the core design comes in and the material selection and processes come in. So what are the research opportunities when I talk about materials? Accurate materials properties characterization over a range of gigahertz to terahertz frequencies. We are talking about high end of gigahertz. Um, for real application in 5G, we are talking about 28 gigahertz today, right? 24, 28 gigahertz. And where research is doing now is in the 140 to 20, 300 gigahertz. You need to characterize the materials, look at the dielectric loss, look at the um, dielectric constant as a variation of frequency, as a function of temperature when you subject it for reliability test, so on and so forth. I showed you different interfacial materials and properties, different interfaces, polymer metal, polymer polymer, fracture toughness, micromechanical properties characterization, deep understanding of addition strength, chemical properties like Van der Waals, dipole, covalent bonding. When I read all these things, I, I'm taken back to my physics days. I think I always say that physics is the foundation because wherever you go in, you apply into electronics, you come back to semiconductor. You go into material science and look at the strength of materials, you come back to physics, right? So dielectric stress and strain measurements and the thermal and mechanical loading. So you have different loading conditions. If you subject it for vibration drop test, you have mechanical loading. You subject it for temperature cycling, you have thermal loading conditions. How is your stress strain and Young's modulus variation? Innovative materials and assembly processes. The device sizes, if you talk about chips that are analog chips that are doing simple amplifiers, they are like, 0.1 millimeter by 0.1 millimeter today because of the silicon technology node that has enabled for the devices to be that small. 0.1 millimeter by 0.1 millimeter. If you sneeze, thousands of devices will fly off. One sneezing. That is the type of dimensions that we are talking about the devices. So how do you pick and place these devices, right? So we are working on some innovative ideas like how do you do self-assembly processes for ultra small and thin devices. Nanoscale, nanoscale material. So what, finally we have turned into materials for electrical and thermal conductivity. We need super electrical conductivity, we need super thermal conductivity, so nanomaterials, right? So high, higher permittivity for capacitors, lower permittivity for 
high frequency application. You want low directed constant for high, high frequency, you want high permittivity for capacitors. So you are stretched between all these requirements coming from system integration point of view. So there is a push towards using metallic fillers for high permittivity capacitors. Better frequency stability with nanoscale composites. So if you, the more you use nanoscale composites, you can build capacitors, 3D capacitors, and embedded capacitors would be the need of the decade. Improved magnetic properties. You want high Q inductors, high frequency inductors, inductors that would function at higher frequencies. So improved magnetic properties, magnetic materials, nanomaterials with improved magnetic properties, again, is a need. Strength and fatigue resistance. Enhance processability. So I, I've just given you some idea about where nanomaterials are playing a research for system integration. Example of micro copper versus nano copper, where your stress is much, nano copper, nano nickel would withstand high cycles of failure. And that is exactly what we want. Because if you really look at how the nano copper material can beat the micro copper in their stress strain uh, modifications. I just wanted to show you before I wrap up with some examples, mixed signal design challenges. I talked about mixed signal design. You have RF device, you have memory device, you have sensor die, you have processor die, and you, are, you have antennas exciting, um, you know, radiating out. And there are different types of planar antenna that are being practiced for these systems, uh, microscope patch antenna, dipole, voltage antenna with the right transmission line feeds. They're all happening there. What I'm showing schematically on the left-hand side is a system that you will see in, a, in your smartphone today. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that I worked on the i12 products. Um, you, know, I, you know, Texas Instrument is a supplier for Apple. And um, so we have worked together to make some system integration and what, what you see in multiple cameras and um, the optics associated with that and the electronics and the optoelectronics associated with that we, we supplied to iPhone Max Pro 12. So you will see these type of integration a common thing in the years to come. What does that mean? You want antenna integration, you want matching networks, you need tunable and decoupling capacitors, you have millimeter wave transition, your impedance matching exercises all have to be done. You have to have tons of interconnections between actives and passives. You have to have design for low parasitic inductance capacitance so that your noise can be managed. And you have to have these connections in three dimensional because you are not going to have these thousands of interconnections from all these devices done in 2D. So you have to have 3D wiring. And last but not the least, the EMI, the coupling, conductive coupling and radiative coupling. You can have horizontal coupling, you have vertical coupling. So how do you model all these things? So the challenge is to really do some finite element or finite difference model. And by the way, a transmission line matrix model, when I used that for my PhD, uh, the algorithm, the person who developed the algorithm gave a seminar, I remember that, you know, and he came and talked about the algorithm behind the transmission line matrix models. And then he talked about the primary wavefront and secondary wavefront. And then I stood up and asked that question, is it not Huygens principle in optics? And he said, yes. So that's where physics comes in. So what we learn is Huygens principle in optics, the formation of primary wavefront and wavelet formation and formation of the secondary wavefront. And that's exactly the principle that the transmission line matrix modeling software has used today. Just to give you a feel of where, where all physics is going, right? And then um, here's an example of what I've shown on the right-hand side where an analog IC, microprocessor, memory stack, integrated passive devices, embedded capacitors, all integrated in a module, right? This is what the system that we are handling today. And you will have more and more complex systems as we go into the um, into this decade. I talked about thermal management, which is nothing but physics. Again, thermodynamics, heat transfer, right material selection. So if I look at the, sex, the center portion of it, passive methods, you need heat sinks. If you open a, a huge desktop today, you will see a bulky heat, heat sink. But if you have a smartphone, you don't have the space to put a heat sink. You have to Figure out with some innovative materials that can take the heat out with a high thermal conductivity nanomaterial, or you have to use a very thin heat spreader to take the heat out. You can have a thermal via to take the heat from a high dissipating chip to the surroundings. So all that you are trying to do is to take the heat from the top dissipating chip to the less dissipating chip so that the, the big chip where you have dissipating more power will not go back because of a hotspot. And then you have to figure out 
those passive methods. There are active methods being used for liquid cooling, spray cooling. So we are trying to bring in fluids and liquids into these chips so that you can have active cooling. And this is again thermodynamics and physics applied to electronics. I talked about many interfaces. So thermal interfaces, you, you to put a heat sink to the chip, you have to attach the heat sink to the chip. That means you are bringing another material and that material has to have a good thermal conductivity. Otherwise, there's no point in having a heat sink. The heat is not going to get to the heat sink because of a poor interface material. So thermal interface material is another huge research opportunity from system integration point of view. There, folks are working on phase change materials, metal-based in, in film interfaces, thermal greases, etc., etc. Coming to the core design, electrical thermal I touched, now the mechanical aspect of it, you have elasticity, plasticity, viscoelasticity, viscoplasticity, fracture, fatigue. So materials will die out of fatigue. Materials can crack out of um, temperature excursions. Me materials can crack out of mechanical loading. But the fundamental thing is to really manage the coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch of the materials that you select. And how do you play the game by selecting the materials in integrating them, whether you have a polymer metal or a ceramic metal or metal metal interfaces in ICs and systems. Okay, so here is a snapshot of those uh, who are interested. Those are research scholars, faculty members who are interested in looking at what are the research opportunities in the topic that I'm covering today. I go from the uh, right bottom, electrical challenges, signal integrity. I talked about noise analysis, noise suppressions, EMI, power integrity, system partitioning for high voltage and low voltage, isolation technologies between high voltage and low voltage. And then how do you handle power density in very small devices? On the left bottom, I talked about um, thermal challenges, heat transfer paths, innovations in interface materials and adhesives and epoxies, materials, nanomaterials, electrical properties, characterization in terms of dielectric constant loss factor, insulation resistance, uh, insertion losses, and your S21, S11 parameters using VNA, characterization into gigahertz, mechanical properties, CTE, modulus and creep properties, and thermal conductivity. And last but not the least, how do you assemble these ultra-thin devices? And another reliability mechanism that we always encounter in reliability-related um, matter is electromigration. And that's again physics, right? Um, I will just quickly talk about electromechanical systems. It's important that I connect electromechanical systems here because that's a uh, talk of the day and lots of devices are out there in the area of optical and RF MEMS, microelectromechanical systems. So what it means is you can create mechanical functions by electrical impulses on a silicon chip. That is electromechanical system. Okay. And then uh, you can have mechanical devices, you can have optical RF MEMS, bio MEMS. This is what I meant by the uh, viral RNA extraction, uh, micro PCR. You are familiar with the PCR test now in the context of COVID-19. Uh, there are um, RNA extraction, DNA extraction chips that are in the market today using the micro PCR and detection. Um, physical inertial MEMS, accelerometers, relays, switches, and so on and so forth. So what it means for a physicist to understand MEMS, you start with solid state physics, you start with crystallography, right? You have 111100. I think we all learned this single crystal silicon. The, the technology and process technology have come up with different types of etching methods, dry etching, wet etching, isotropic etching, and isotropic etching processes. I may not have the time to go through each one of the details, but the beauty here is on a crystal silicon, one can get cantilever beams. You can create microfluidic channels. You name it. I think to micro scale dimensions and nano scale dimensions. You have cavity resonators. You can create cavities. You can create cantilever beams. You can create um, fluidic channels. And this fluid, fluidic channels can be used for pumping in fluid for cooling, cooling fluids for thermal management. You can use it for biofluidics. And those are some of the applications that uh, folks are using today in the industry. I think there will be lots of research in that area moving from MEMS to NEMS technologies and beyond. I'll show you two examples and then I will wrap up of the recent work. 
I choose sensor as one and antenna integration as another one. In the area of sensor, as I said, IoT start with sensors, Internet of Things, where I started the seminar. I showed you an example of IoT. Um, every sensor application needs power, whether it is a temperature sensor, pressure sensor, position sensor, touch, speed, flow, humidity, sound, light, identification, right? You can use RF means, you can use optical means for all this detection, whatever means you, you are comfortable with. And there will be a, receive, a transmitting section and a receiving section, amplifier, data convert, converters, interface circuits, wireless connectivity to the external world, logic circuits, so on and so forth. In the middle, you will have a processor chip and a power management chip. You need power, you need processors. This is a sensor system, right? Now, in the context of a biosensor, I want to give you an example because we are all living and breathing in the world of pandemic now. See, if I have a biomolecule like enzymes or antibodies or DNA, RNA, tissue cells, anything of that kind, what I need is a mechanism that will capture a biomolecule and translate that capture into a variation in impedance or resistance or weight or light or sound or heat. The rest is possible. Once you have an impedance variation, you know what to do with that. Right? You can connect to circuit, you can connect to a plot, you can get that. But the tricky part of these biosensors is to really look at this receptor design and how do you characterize which feature in that biomolecule is something that I can capture safely and that would give me one of this physical variation or an optical variation or an acoustic variation or a resistance variation. Then I connect that uh, uh, a sound detector or a thermistor or a photodiode, the rest of it is electronics. And then you have all the electronics that I showed in the previous foil to interface, process, compute, and communicate. So this is a biosensor system schematically. And I show you one research work that uh, I was a part of uh, this activity at Georgia Tech, where we looked at a conductimetric impedance-based measurement using a zinc oxide nanowire so the nano wire we developed has the capability to detect the IgG. The IgG is the most common type of antibody found in blood circulation. So everyone, we all have the IgG as a detector. And we could capture that into the zinc oxide nano wire, which is integrated into a silicon chip. And the silicon chip had the rest of the electronics also integrated. So we could do the processing, computing, and communicating. And that was a full system that we developed and the electrical impedance variation after functionalization and hybridization. Functionalization is to identify the IgG and hybridization is to convert that detection into a variation of impedance. Okay, so this is a, a successful uh, work that we have done, lots of papers and publications, in, including a paper in Nature. Um, one other example I wanted to show um, is in a totally different domain. This is happening as we speak for 5G communication where on-chip antenna and off-chip antenna, research is pushing in the direction of 120, 140 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. This is a paper published by a Japanese company called NTT. They have used a multi-layer ceramic, ceramic substrate to have all the devices integrated, and they have put a horn antenna. Horn antenna has got the maximum bandwidth and uh, high efficiency. And LTCC is a low temperature co-fired ceramic very high, uh, very good and reasonably uh, appreciative properties for microwave in terms of dielectric loss. Here are the features that I wanted to show in terms of the antenna parameters that we looked at. And um, we have a substrate integrated waveguide. So, um, you know, people who are working on functional materials, polymer, functional polymers, functional ceramics materials. Here are examples where, um, you know, polymer waveguides and ceramic waveguides are integrated and a cavity inside the multi-layer substrate and the surrounding via fence is created for EMI isolation. So whatever I gave you a feel of system integration is, is a reality today, it's happening. All right, and here is an example of what myself and my team developed at Texas Instruments. This is where we have used a circular patch antenna, um, which is integrated on a laminate substrates. It has got um, the, um, the rest of the electronics integrated as well on the laminate substrates and the antenna array comes on the top and uh, we also have the reflectors for the antenna to suppress any 
um, isolation, I mean, suppress any noise that comes in, substrate modes and prevented unwanted radiations. So I just wanted to give, and this is a 120 to 140 gigahertz and um, on the research side, and uh, we have released a product at 77 gigahertz, just to give you a feel where the industry is and where the research is, as far as this activity is concerned. So with that, I think um, I would wrap up. I hope I am um, reasonably on time. Maybe I'm overshoot by five minutes. What I tried to give you in this uh, one hour or so is to discuss uh, the trends associated with the devices and system integration technology. Some salient aspects of uh, where we are in terms of integration on chip and off chip by highlighting the physics, design, materials, and characterization needs. And uh, I tried to give some examples of recent work and opportunities in design, opportunities in materials and processes ahead for system integration technologies. Thank you, and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you, sir. The presentation is open for discussion. So you can ask questions directly or you can type in the chat box. <laughs> <clears throat> Dr. Mahanaman. Hi, Professor Rao. Hi, here I am. Good to see you. <laughs> uh, it's an amazing thing. Uh, I wish I, I could absorb uh, at least a small fraction of what you have given, but it is so exciting to I hear you the recent developments in technology, particularly the integration and all that. Um, I could see when I hear you, we are not far off into some of this very advanced technology, 5G and, and then you were talking about the integration and then uh, power management and uh, all that. But uh, when it comes to applications, uh, if I see some of the systems that are, you know, uh, civilian thing, uh, I'm not so sure about the difference in the US, uh, but anyway, even here, uh, we still hang on to the technologies uh, and uh, the same kind of limitations that uh, I have known even when I was, uh, you know, in Kerala University that 40, 50 years ago, uh, taking, for example, in the satellite communications or uh, the weather radars uh, or even uh, exploration radars from satellites uh, and some of the remote sensing applications, um, they still seem to struggle with you know, designing the antennas and then mm -hmm. how to manage the power uh, thing. For example, uh, if I get a fraction of what you were telling, uh, the solutions do not seem to be too far to uh, simplify some of these instruments, like you take the weather yeah. radar. Uh, people are talking about, now it is only, it's like a big system, you put it over the, coast and uh, you know track your cyclone or uh, tornado or whatever kind of thing even in the United States you see um, it hits uh, so much of disaster happens and all that but then the there must be some technological solutions uh, to uh, monitor this on time scales and spatial scales uh, to an extent, uh, you will be able to, in real time, keep on, uh, you know, managing uh, other social systems like, uh, you know, evacuating the people or finding alternate uh, or mitigating even some of these disasters. Uh, yeah. So, what would be the need? Uh, what would be the need on those systems? You you are looking for. Miniaturized uh, millimeter wave or miniaturized yeah, radar. Is, radar, is, radar the system. question is the technology is available 
um, right on uh, in situ where the instrument is. For example, if the technology is great over the satellite, you can miniaturize the things, processors, process the data. Well, when it comes to communication, you're still stuck with an atmosphere through which mm. it, has to, it has to pass through. So, um, is there a, actually a Windows, microwave Windows? Some Windows may be there where it is uh, uh, relatively transparent, but not to the degree um, where you will uh, get a you know bandwidth at different frequencies um, to effectively communicate from satellite satellite to the ground. Uh, even if you increase the bandwidth and all that, and uh, this uh, uh, atmospheric limitations will be there to limit the bandwidth and all that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so for example, sorry. you take the you take the optic. Yeah. Uh, why don't we jump to the you know optical wavelengths and uh, from mm -hmm. satellite to the ground? Obviously, we we will not be able to do that, and we still have to depend on the you know fiber optics uh, and the ground systems and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you so actually? I, I mean, after all, we are actually communicating uh, the world over, but we use the satellites to communicate and all that. Do you foresee down the line um, the ground systems and the technologies will advance to a point where you can do away with the satellites altogether and, and, and the ground systems <laughs> come back, come back into <laughs> the effect like you know television in the beginning when the satellites were not there. You have 120 uh, relay stations from coast to coast and then the yeah. communication is there in the rest. Uh, but of course, it sadly does uh, thing. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I I wouldn't go with the uh, do away with the satellite to start with, but at least you know, as a first step, what I would do is to really look at the. If I were to look at electronics hardware and VSAT and um, the ground sat the um, ground station that we are trying to do, whatever I showed as examples on system integration, the miniaturization is coming from commercial to automotive to defense and aerospace. That is the phase it is. So oh. if you ask me, do we have 5G in um, automotive? It's not there yet. It's just beginning to come. Maybe next three, four years, 5G communications will come into automotive. Do we have 5G in defense and aerospace today? No. Because, because the reliability, you have to have demonstration in commercial first before automotive access. And once automotive and commercial runs it for a few, few years, then the, then the defense will say, let me try it on my missile systems. And then the spacecraft comes in. So what I have seen over the last 20 years is, it's a phased, at least about three to four years of gap of introduction from commercial sector to defense aerospace sector. So to answer your question, the first and foremost is to try it out on ground stations and uh, communications near earth orbit uh, with these miniaturized subsystem but the functional blocks and the building blocks that we are building yeah. they will find applications that is what i would say hmm. actually even uh, even there uh, if you take a radar uh, we, we still are unable to uh, um, actually extract the signal from the noise uh, to uh, study either the space or atmosphere exactly. properties. Yes. There are some, some regions which are not uh, uh, even today we cannot explore, um, saying that the signal is so damn weak that we are unable to extract from the, from the noise. Like for example, uh, uh, an atmospheric radar uh, will give uh, in the troposphere up to 20 kilometers and then again you get some signals from the ionosphere and the uh, stratosphere where this ozone and all these things are there some optical systems do work but then we do not get complete information about that uh, the middle atmosphere that's the stratosphere mesosphere kind of a thing 
like that there are there are blocks where in space uh, in space sciences where the technology is uh, I mean from what I hear uh, from material science point of view from devices point of view from signal processing point of view all those things um, this uh, processing technologies are way ahead once you get yeah. the signal you are you are right there. I mean, in extracting the thing and all that, and algorithms are there and all that. Although uh, students still struggle um, how to actually uh, after getting the signal, what is the optimal algorithm to uh, get, for example, this machine language kind of thing, neural network, so, genetic, the genetic noise suppression. Uh, I think where you have to really come in, Professor Rao, is the with the noise suppression techniques. So, so yeah. there are algorithms and there are tools available today, but I need to get some more details on the type of signals that you are receiving from uh, stratosphere, ionosphere, and things like that, and where exactly the issues are. Oh, that, that would be but a challenge. Are, no, I mean, I will put it in a simple way uh, so that uh, you can actually uh, think about it. We need to understand if at all if you want to make any advances in um, weather forecasting or all that we need to understand from ground 200 kilometers okay with a very high resolution um, a device um, basically a radar a remote sensing device an active remote sensing device which can map the turbulence winds and waves which means essentially the dynamics of the atmosphere from ground to 100 kilometers, how to miniaturize the systems and proliferate so that this Princeton fellows or some people who have developed mammoth programs uh, could benefit from this data, um, which is, you know, there are gaps. They, they are filling it with physics, but, but experimentally they do not have like uh, like i said if yeah. i want every few meters the wind and the turbulence parameters all the way to 100 kilometers it, there's nothing like that there is no instrument no nothing like that uh, it does now uh like rainfall even <laughs> rainfall uh, you say rainfall is different at different heights and what reaches the ground is different <laughs> from what because it will go through various stages. So yes, yeah. even for the US, one of the challenges is to characterize the rainfall on a global scale, particularly in the tropical region. In our region, um, a satellite mission which could characterize the rain as a function of and space, I mean, all over the globe as a function of height. Uh, what are the transitions it goes through kind of a thing. I mean, it goes through vapor phase and then uh, uh, liquid phase and then the vapor phase. It, it goes yeah. through the, all those transitions. Finally, we end up measuring on the ground what it falls kind of thing. So uh, these, are, these are the things since I am in that business, I, I, I could see, um, I mean, when I hear about you, I get excited. I think what it, what a fantastic, uh, you know, developments that are taking place in technology. Yeah, we will continue to have this conversation, Professor Rao. I would love to do that. Yeah, I I think, uh, you listen to the, uh, finally, I, I um, just to say, uh, take a few seconds. Uh, finally, you suggest something to the physics department. What kind of a training in terms of the experiments maybe not immediately now, probably when you go back, uh, you can think of some experiments which can be done uh, by <laughs> so many generations after you, the uh, applied electronics students, um, uh, which will give them some uh, feel for our excitement uh, to get into the uh, sure. Uh, the recent and the uh, frontier areas of research. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Here and uh, congratulations for all that you have accomplished and uh, 
uh, and I am so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you for your guidance and inspiration and uh, blessings. Thank you. Good. Thank you, sir. Sir, there are some questions in the chat box. Maybe you can. Yeah, go ahead. Shall I read it? Yeah. I think I lost you, Dr. Subol. Are you there? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. I mean, you okay. said you have some questions to ask me. Right? Yeah, the, the, the questions in the chat box. Maybe you can okay. also read that. Uh, uh, SAP, SOC, MCM, what will be the future packaging technology? Okay. So SIP, system in package and system on chip. Right, that was a SIP, SOP, and what was that MCM? So let me let me define you what is MCM. So MCM is multi-chip module. So you have if you have uh, multiple active dies integrated in a module, that is what is considered as multi-chip module. System in package is you have actives and passives. So you have uh, functional devices, amplifier, oscillators, uh, switches, relays, whatever you call, plus your inductors, capacitors. That is something what we call as system in package. System on package is something that uh, Georgia Tech came up with a, a new definition. And uh, why they were trying to uh, coin that is SIP integrates actives and passives. But what about battery? What about uh, heat sinks? What about your high Q inductors that are going to be embedded? Uh, typically, SIP and SOP are interchangeably used. And um, the future of that, if you were to really look at multi-chip module, active functional devices integration is the first thing that is happening today. For example, Texas Instruments have shipped 700 million units of uh, multi-chip modules last year, just to give you a feel of that. That means what cannot be integrated on chip and what comes in as more feasible to integrate outside the chip. If I have to use a high Q inductor, for example, if I want to integrate a high Q inductor on a single chip, I have to have a high resistivity silicon and high, resi high resistivity silicon is expensive. So my preference would be to put a high resistivity uh, high, high, high Q inductor outside the chip, right? So to answer your question, MCM would be the first one that take off. It's a, it has already taken off the ground full force. SIP in a smaller scale is happening, actives and passive integration. And um, thin film inductors, thin film capacitors, folks are working on um, capacitor integration on substrate, uh, inductor integration, coil integration um, for with uh, high-end magnetic properties, including nanomaterials, trying to integrate in a very miniaturized form. That is happening. They are all the SIP developments. Um, I would say if uh, 700 million units of MCMs are shipped, maybe 50 million units of SIPs are shipped today, just to give you a feel. But I think uh, this decade will see more and more of MCMs and SIP. So he has also asked about the future packaging. So future packaging, there is a, a lot is predicted on wafer scale. So um, some of you might be familiar with the terminology called wafer scale packaging. I showed the wire bond and flip chip two variations. So while we were all working on that, about 15 years ago, the concept of wafer scale packaging came. Why not, why not we integrate on package? Why can't we put the encapsulated on, encapsulant on top of the mold so that I can get the packaging done at the wafer level? Uh, but then there is a huge uh, issue with the board level reliability. When I attach that wafer scale integrated package on a substrate, for the reason that I said the coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch, um, you, are, you will develop cracks at the interface between silicon and the board. And that is still a problem. If somebody can break the ice, that will, person will be, a, you know, there will be multiple PhDs that can be released from that topic. Even today, uh, people use underfill materials to minimize that mismatch. So that is one of the reasons why wafer scale packaging has not become very popular. There are reliability concerns and wafer scale packaging cannot withstand drop and vibration, which are primarily needed for defense and aerospace, including commercial products. So, 
what would be the future wafer scale packaging if we can solve some of the things that would be the future i would say at that point of at this point of time okay sir the ne next question is about the directivity of millimeter antennas hmm any so, comment on the directivity of millimeter antennas millimeter wave antennas yeah it depends on the selection of the antenna i i gave you some example um you know dipole patch um and uh, we are working on bow tie slotted bow tie um so we we don't generally worry with directivity alone right you have to think in terms of gain efficiency bandwidth which band you are looking at what would be the performance if i really want to have a micro strip uh, transmission line feeding a patch antenna i need to really look at the dispersive losses right i mean even taking the signal from the chip through the feed element to um the antenna right so the antenna design coupled with the transmission line and are we going to run the transmission line on silicon or on a laminate or ceramic i would say it is a, a combined effort rather than just looking at the antenna alone uh but that's a good question i would say um the, the these are the type of antennas that we have experimented i would say above 60 gigahertz the research work what i'm directly involved is looking from 140 to 220 gigahertz we have figured out what to do up to 140 gigahertz now now the next thing is really look at 140 to 220 and beyond the next question is how far we are from installing integrated circuits on human nervous system <clears throat> human nervous system okay so bio ics are implantable implanted you have uh, defibrillators implanted on your body today um you have um, in vivo devices for ears um for uh, hearing impaired um when you say nervous system is that connected to the spine i mean your specific question because the spinal cord there are certain research work going on uh, i know the uc berkeley has come up with an artificial eye for blind people with so it is connected to the spine he was asking about the spine okay uh, that is uh, a challenge so that's a great question it is not there yet whoever has asked that question um uh, but even in university of texas dallas there are um you know once you go in and start working on your spine because spine is your you know <laughs> we call it as nuttal right so i mean at this point of time you, you are hesitating to uh, go in and implant something on the spine so there are activities i would say there are activities research activities happening where they are trying to simulate what can be done on a human spine and unless you get 100% perfection uh, doctors do not prefer to go and implant devices on spine but to answer your question specifically um, the target dates that i have seen is 2020 2025 2026 you will see something implantable devices on spine connecting to the nervous system yeah i think okay, I hello yeah yeah mamta please any please yeah, hi actually it was very nice talk i am dr mamta just related to from physics department so this is uh, coming back to the our students question jijit which has asked he has asked about the uh, response uh, sorry about the neuron um, how integrated circuit can be implemented in neural uh, system response of the neuron system so i think this is uh, basically that uh, theoretically whatever you said that simulation uh, whatever we see that due to the suppression of noise there is a phenomenon and uh, just stochastic resonance so the yeah. response used to be uh, enhanced basically uh, i i had also one question related to this uh, like uh, what you mentioned in uh, when designing the medical devices for example sensors and all Uh, so this uh, you mentioned two phenomena. One is active cavity noise suppression, and another one is ac active exit noise uh, suppression. So this active actually, basically, theoretically, whatever we uh, say that this active relates to like self-generating uh, force or autonomous force. It's a kind of mm -hmm. self-proportion of uh, this uh, uh, motors inside cells. So how uh, I mean that how this term active. 
uh, you can uh, correlate it, uh, correlate to the technological advance in the I means how this uh, term active refers or maybe uh, how you can in technological advances how you will implement this. So your yeah. question is suppression of noise. And how do we know, I mean, I showed you an example of a simple biosensor where you have, where we identified the IgG, the antibody in a blood, and then trying to find out the receptor and what, what, exa what feature of the biomolecule you are trying to amplify and yes. detect yeah. using, de detect using detection is, once you identify it, then the detection becomes easier because I'm going to use an optical detection or an acoustic detection or a weight detection, that yeah. part of it, right? Yeah. Challenge is always identifying yeah. the, what what are you going after? Yes, right? in the output, right. I mean that detect, that signal might be that uh, Rao Osar also was mentioning that in case of atmospheric label in different labels, the density, basically the viscous, it varies, air density or air drug. So there will be lots of dissipation. So signal might be, I think that is due to also that also kind yeah, of. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, so here actually I was thinking that what is this active uh, means? Because active, everybody says now in theoretically, we say that this is a kind of autonomous force which already exists and it is due to the medium or environment that is due to noise. Mm -hmm. But nobody mm -hmm. knows so far what is exactly from where this force is coming. So people say that this is a motor that which is just uh, this is a kind of bias. It's coming from the environment that can be due to viscous or maybe due to noise. And so when we are supposed designing the circuit or more, uh, artificial uh, design of the motor or integrated circuits in digital uh, electronic uh, by applying the electronic uh, application. So in that case, how this active with that we can um, in implement in a technologically advanced, um, no, that's what I was, I was thinking so, I mean. Yeah, so once you, once you identify what component you're going after, what active component, I gave you a couple of examples, then it is becomes easier from the chip point of view. We can design the sensitive elements inside the, inside the chip. So you have transducers and sensors, right? So you can design the chip in such a way that whatever active component you are bringing in from your uh, interest, for example, your interest is to go after motion or your interest is to really go after vibration. I mean, you need to define that. And then accordingly on the receiving side, on the chip side, you can create analog sensors with very high accuracy, with high noise suppression, with high noise suppression mechanisms. That is possible. Possible, yeah. So, but, yeah. but that situation one has to, yeah, uh, practically actually it is so far it is not. Uh... Yeah, but, but co-design, that's what I meant by chip co-design. If you have hmm. certain electrical hmm. parameters or it could be a mechanical motion or it can be a, um, a, a force, um, and then you try to say that I'm going to bring in acceleration from the force is my vector that I'm going to identify as the feature. And then all that we need to do is to, I showed you a microelectromechanical system, right, MEMS, which is primarily nothing but electrical signals and electrical signals that will enable the mechanical movement on the chip. And that is what you need to connect these two pieces together, right? So MEMS devices, um, Primarily, MEMS devices found their applications to start with is in bio for two reasons. One is um, from the biofluidics, you know, whether it is uh, uh, human body sweat or saliva or whatever it is, right? You have to have a chip that would accept that as a raw material, right? In your case, what you're saying is the active component, you have to de design what is the active component you're going to bring in and what feature is what you are going to go after. Is it a mechanical motion or is it an electrical motion or is it a light? And then from there, we can go and devise the uh, microelectromechanical device suitable for that. I hope I explained how you want to link in. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, sir, the next question is how to transform the country from consumer economy to a production economy in the electronic area? Consumer economy to production economy. Yes. 
So consumer, I, I'm trying to take your question as consumer as um, something that, um, you know, consumer electronics. Like you and I go and buy something from the shop, we are consumers, right? So that's consumer economy that you are building, right? If you go and buy a laptop or iPad or iPhone or Samsung phone, they are all consumer electronics. When you meant by production economy, are you saying, how do you bring in manufacturing uh, into the real world? Is that what you're saying? I he said that, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. No. So I think um, that's a great question because one is prototyping. So when you say, hey, I, I have a concept, I need to bring this idea into prototype, so you prototype. Prototype goes through development phase. You have to take it into development, right? You have to make, make hundreds and thousands of parts. That is what we call development. When you develop, you are ensuring that you have the design is robust, your materials are robust, your process is robust. You, you, uh, you have validated the reliability, and then you say, I'm going to launch this product. So you have to go, go through the qualification phase, and then you have to qualify that product for uh, smartphone or automotive or industrial or aerospace. You have to qualify the product. And then you get a green signal that the product is qualified. Now you are going into a ramp mode. Like before you get into highway, you go through a ramp while you are driving, right? Before you get to the highway to take full speed. So after your qualification, you have a phase called ramp phase, which is where you are converting thousands of units into 100,000 units or 200,000 units. And then you take it into manufacturing. That is where you go into millions of units. So this is the, the whole chain of from prototype to manufacturing. Now, what you are saying is, if I have a product in consumer application, how do I connect it into a manufacturing economy? So for which you need to have the supply chain. You have, that is a difference between a prototyping mechanism for if I want to buy 10 products versus 100 products versus million products from you. You have to get it into high volume, which means you have to have the supply chain of companies who can provide you the materials, who can provide you the equipment, you can have provide you the uh, entire infrastructure, whether it is light, water supply, you name it, building infrastructure. And then you will say, okay, I'm ready for manufacturing. And the profit and loss that I'm going to get out of that manufacturing will boost my manufacturing economy. Unless, until unless I get that entire infrastructure built, I'm not into manufacturing economy. I'm still in prototyping and development mode. And somebody else will manufacturing. Do, do the manufacturing for you. And that is how the in, the in the chip manufacturing industry, the foundry concept came, foundry services. You do the design, I will fabricate for you. You don't have to have the supply chain for that, but I will take money for you from for my manufacturing. And you include your profit and loss, including my manufacturing cost into your product cost. So all that you do is design and product development, whereas I do the manufacturing but then you don't have to bear the manufacturing cost. You pay the money for me to manufacture. You see how the economy works there, right? Hope I explain. Okay, sir, the next, next question is, uh, when low permittivity materials are considered for high frequency applications, like once used in patch antennas, how the issue of imprints matching can be addressed? Okay, so you are bringing two topics there. One is the uh, low dielectric constant or low tan delta material, which is preferred, right? Typically, we, we would like prefer to have the epsilon R somewhere around 2.5, 2, 2 3, um, and the frequency variation as you go for millimeter wave frequency, you need to characterize that and get it. The antenna is sitting there, your materials on the substrate or material on silicon, right? You are characterizing the raw material but then you are actually trying to put um, these low permittivity materials into your substrate. So there is one additional thing that you have to look at when you bring in, even if your material is good, once you put, put that into your substrate, how your substrate is processed and what is the skin depth, skin effect of the thin film processes that you are trying to take the signal through the transmission line, that has got an impact. Your insertion loss on the substrate need to be characterized, not just the material acid as it is. So I brought the other topic there. That is the characterization of the substrate with the material of low dielectric constant and tan delta, right? 
and then uh, you have to design the transmission line um, you know whether you use a strip line or cpw depending on what transmission line you are looking for you will design a 50 ohm line there but the moment you take the signal from the chip through the pump that i showed a solder pump or a wire that is a transition right so you will have a reflection there then the wire where wire is terminated on to the substrate that is a transition then you are taking the signal through the transmission line that is another transition of the transmission line itself you are not going to get the 50 ohm that you design once you put that on the substrate because of the insertion losses then you talk about the transmission line antenna feed to the antenna so i, I explained four transition already in a simple model right each transition needs to be modeled and you may have to do some parametric optimization there to make sure that your each of the transition the losses are minimized you will have some losses you are not going to get a completely uh, less lossy i mean less lossy transition there will be some losses so you need to continue to work on it to minimize the transition minimize the losses in the transition so that you will get the signal from the chip to the antenna and you asked a simple question on reflection noise at the impedance mismatch but impedance mismatches are all happening at each transition level and you have to do a um, finite element or method of moments you know typically you you have studied i hope you are working on some of the greens functions and method of moments and numerical modeling and analysis as well as a part of computational electromagnetics so i think you will get an idea of what i'm saying you have to do that uh, modeling to do that and there are you don't have to worry about it when i graduated we had only maxwell's equations in front of us to solve those equations and then get the value there were no tools but you have uh, many more tools today um, you know in the form of uh, ansoft uh, ansys and hfss high frequency structure simulator tools uh, where you can um, model this 3d models and compute and get your s11 s21 parameters as well so we are using HFSS. Then. Good. Yeah. So HFSS, uh, it used to be ANSOF. Now they have been bought over by ANSYS. And, and the, the reason for that is just what I explained, the core design, because ANSYS had mechanical and thermal tools. And they didn't have the uh, electromagnetic field solver. So they bought ANSOF company. So now ANSYS has everything. OK. So our uh, next question is, at atmospheric attenuation effect at, of 140 gigahertz. I think this is related to one of your answers because you told that you made an antenna at 140 gigahertz. So the question is atmospheric attenuation effect of 140. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what we are doing here at 140 is not exclusively for atmospheric attenuation, but that is a good point to bring in because um, 77 gigahertz and 94 gigahertz are used for automotive communication, will be used and is being used, I would say. And uh, the future is uh, they want to communicate between automotives, two cars to be communicated automotive wirelessly while you are driving, uh, hands-free. So uh, with that intention, they are pushing the envelope to 94 gigahertz. Um, and the research is pushing in the order of uh, 90 to 140 and 140 to 220. So your antenna dimensions are very small, that is for sure. and. Um, the, the challenge there is to integrate them and uh, have it in micro miniaturized modules. But I think once we step into 140 gigahertz, you will have the opportunity um, for the atmospheric attenuation as well. Yes. Okay, sir. You have, uh, the, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the next question is the green underfills and green substrate refers only to lead free materials. Yeah, green underfills and green uh, substrate materials are lead-free. The green word stands for lead-free, and then they have extended to halogen-free also. So chlorine, bromine, and other toxic uh, gases. So basically, there is a strong push from the electronics industry to be uh, to make the environment green, and um, US is uh, fast adopting to it. Europe uh, would adapt by 2024, but um, most of the companies have switched their solder from lead-based solder to lead-free solders. And uh, th this would be applied into electronics, warfare, missiles, and aerospace applications as well. 
But the challenge uh, in the last five to 10 years was to get the reliability what lead-based solders have accomplished over the past five decades. I think electronics industry is so used to solder, uh, nobody was willing to accept this new material and there was a strong pushback and then uh, finally the green green revolution won. Uh, everybody had to go into uh, lead-free and halogen-free materials. Uh, but, but I should say that not necessarily uh, limited to underfills and substrate. I just uh, showed that example. I think probably that is the reason why that question is asked. But uh, the mold compound, the encapsulants, the thermal interface materials, wherever you are trying to bring in any forms of lead, that needs to be lead free. So tin copper, tin antimony bismuth, these are the materials that are used as an alternate for lead solders today. If there are any questions, you can ask. Otherwise, we move on to the next session. Uh, Dr. Madhavan, I just uh, connected with uh, one of the questions that somebody asked you about the nine, uh, 90 gigahertz to 148 gigahertz, no? the atmospheric uh, attenuation. See, the, the band, uh, the W band, the 90 gigahertz band yeah. is yeah. used for the cloud microphysics studies. Uh, you can look at that. Actually, the space borne W band radar is one of the potential instruments for cloud microphysics studies. In fact, you can think of a combination of the frequencies and microwaves. Uh, w band, I know, it gives the Man, cloud microphysics. And, uh, and, 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 uh, I, I, I just wanted to add, I think if you, you have a, uh, some very strong space physics and atmospheric science, I do not know. A space physics group is there in University of Dallas at Dallas. Uh, Rod, uh, Rod Healy's or somebody, I think he's a, a prominent ionospheric uh, plasma electrodynamics person. Uh, but then the specific question that you can ask is, uh, could you improve for cloud microphysics in addition to the W band radar, what is the combination of the radars that will give the entire thermodynamics of the clouds, uh, particularly over the tropical region. So that, okay. that, that would be the uh, state of the art uh, thing for a satellite based uh, studies of the cloud microphysics. Okay, that's a good input. I will definitely follow up on that because that frequency band might be useful for that, right? I mean, uh, in terms of other than the W band radar, other than radars that are used for uh, cloud microphysics, right? And then K uh, K band, uh, K band actually, 35 gigahertz, um, and W band radar, and then of course uh, you have to come down to one weather radar. So these are the yeah. combination which will give you uh, precipitating, non-precipitating, and uh, uh, entire cloud uh, microphysics, physical properties, okay. and thermodynamics. Sure, I've taken some notes, sir. Yeah, okay, we can do that. Thank you. Great. All right, Dr. Subod, um, we are switching to the other session. Sir, so, uh, actually, the MC students, uh, they have uh, an extra departmental class. So that's why you know, maybe we can uh, uh, have the program, this uh, interactive session on another day. Is it possible, sir? Yeah, we because, could do that. Uh, yeah, because uh, already 11.30, that's why. Uh, uh, yeah, that's fine with me. I yeah. mean, if you if the students are not there for the... Uh, um, you know, interactive session, we could schedule another yeah. one hour exclusively for that students, no problem. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, we can do some time later, like one week after, I, I will call you. 
So they're just yeah, exclusively you can, for uh, them. You can drop me an email on that. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So is there any other questions? So if there are no questions, I would like to invite uh, Adira, our research scholar, to say a word of thanks. Thank you, sir. Honorable dignitaries and most valued guests, it's my privilege to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of Department of Physics, University of Kerala, on the occasion of its Golden Jubilee celebrations. We want to express our sincere gratitude to Honorable Speaker, Professor Mahadevan K. Ayya, who has paid his precious time for us and enlightened us with his knowledge. I extend our sincere thanks to all other distinguished guests who grace this occasion with their presence. A warm thanks to the organizing committee, especially our HOD, Dr. CBKS, Dr. Suburji, Dr. V. Biju, and also I would like to acknowledge the immense contribution of all other dedicated faculties of this department. Finally, I would extend my all other gratitude to all the participants of this webinar. Thank you one and all for making this program a huge success. I just wanted to thank uh, each and every one of you who have attended this seminar and also inviting me um, on this um, wonderful occasion of uh, 50th anniversary celebration of the uh, Department of Physics. I'm always indebted to all the faculty members uh, who taught me and the current and the past few faculty members, all of them. And I look forward to me if you need any additional help or guidance on any of the projects and discussions that you guys are doing. And uh, once again, thank you very much for all the attendees and uh, some of my batchmates also attended. I will say hello to all of them as well. Thank you. Sir, you can continue. No, no issue. You can chat. There is no issue. We will <laughs> okay. be uh, online. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Dr. CB. Thank you very much. So what programs you have now? Or what are the research projects in the Department of Physics now? I Hmm. Yeah. Always, thank you. Hi, yes, sir. I am here, but uh, I, I was there from 1988 to 1994. By the time Professor Mahadev and I, Dr. Mahadev and I, sir, was left, I think. Huh? Yes, I was there, 1883. So ah, yeah, I joined in 88 with Arun Das, sir, Dr. Arun Das, sir. I see. Okay. Ah, ah. And Vishwan Arun, sir, was clear to me. Vishwan Arun, sir. I see. Excellent. <laughs> uh.
മഹാരാജാറിന്റെ ബാറ്റ്സ്മേറ്റ്സിന്റെ ഒരു ഗ്രൂപ്പ് കാണുമല്ലോ ഉണ്ടോ അങ്ങനെ ഗ്രൂപ്പില് ഗ്രൂപ്പിൽ ഞാനിപ്പം ഇതിൽ നോക്കിയിട്ട് എനിക്ക് രണ്ട് യാസ്മിൻ ആർയ സ്റ്റിൽ ദർ ഓർ ഹാവ് യു ലെഫ്റ്റ് ഐ സി യാസ്മിൻ ദർ ഓൺ ദി ചാറ്റ് ബോക്സ് യെസ് യാസ്മിൻ എൻ്റെ ബാറ്റ്സ്മേറ്റ് ആണ് ഗുരുനാഥൻ പിള്ള ഗുരുനാഥൻ ആണ് ഉണ്ടോ അതോ ഐസി Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I know Manuel. Yeah, I know Manuel. He is your postdoc advisor. You did your postdoc in uh, UT Dallas? Did you do your postdoc in UT Dallas? I see. So what's your field of expert now? Expert is? Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, fast coming. I mentioned about some 3D capacitors and, and during my talk, but uh, super capacitors uh, will have some applications because it um, can give you a miniaturization and um, high capacitance density. We are looking for uh, solutions that gives very high capacitance density. interesting thank you yeah sir uh, actually we are planning to the alumni of the department uh, we are planning to conduct different alumni meets in 50 alumni meets if sir sir no if sir yeah please <laughs> that alumni uh, we are planning to conduct <laughs> so alumni meets uh, you know if the pandemic situation is getting better and if i can travel i plan to come down i i grew up in kottayam so my hometown is kottayam so um, you know definitely i would uh, visit kerala and then uh, you know if, if there is an opportunity then um, you know we, we will all meet together my batchmates were also saying that we should all get together sometime so we can meet in kariyottam Yeah. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sara, yeah, you... Yeah, yeah. sir, you, you have a lab with a network analyzer and all for the characterization or, or rely on somebody else? Uh, I just joined a year ago because I was in uh, TI for the past uh, 12 to 13 years. So I, I'm setting up the lab, but uh, I have another faculty uh, working with me. She's an associate professor and uh, she has been there with UT Dallas for the past 20 years. So she has uh, a microwave lab, millimeter wave. uh that can go up to uh, 120 giga, 110 gigahertz now the vnas okay uh, but uh, we are actually augmenting that further to 200 plus okay, okay. Uh, so uh, what is the setup that you have subod uh we have a network analyzer uh, up to 40 gigahertz hmm. uh and we can uh, mostly we do the characterization of materials and uh, also an impedance analyzer which goes from 10 megahertz to say 1 gigahertz so these are the two main characterization tools we are having and we work on these uh, materials like material characterization as cb said emi shielding materials and little bit on the antenna part yeah just now only we designed and implemented 
one antenna which can radiate around 12 gigahertz. Uh, it was done by uh, Ardhra. Yeah, what so antenna is designed? Uh, 12, 12 giga, 12 giga. It's a, um, you know that uh, there might be a new technique which is evolving like called, it's called sintering. So you yeah. use uh, water as a, uh, as a tool for sintering at a very low temperature, like 200 degrees Celsius, you will get a ceramic puck, which has almost 90% yeah. density. So th that technique is used for uh, developing an antenna, which is, uh, which is a mixture of a dielectric and a magnetic ferrite. A ferrite and a dielectric material like lithium molybdate yeah. and the ferrite so which radiated around 12 12.5 gigahertz silicon on insulator so some of the uh, lithium neobate um, lto lbo type of technology right that's what you're saying yes 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 interesting silicon silicon on sapphire silicon on insulator um, those technologies are also fast emerging with all okay. the uh, RF and millimeter wave requirements, there is a lot of uh, materials research that are directed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing I can definitely uh, see is on the uh, passives, integrated passives, embedded passives, uh, inductors, capacitors area. Uh, I'm just connecting to material side, more on the material side. Um, then on the um, Optics and uh, I don't know whether there are research going on on that area, optical materials, optics research. There is um, uh, interest on LIDAR technology, the, similar to radar, yeah. light detection ranging. So because of the, uh, both on the smartphone and on automotive, LIDAR is uh, becoming very interesting. And then uh, on the power electronic side, there is strong interest for silicon carbide devices. Uh, silicon carbide, uh, GAN, gallium nitride on silicon carbide. So you can have GAN on silicon or GAN on silicon carbide because uh, GAN high electron mobility. So when you go back to the semiconductor physics, you will see the band gap of these materials are different, right? High mobility yeah. gives you advantage for GAN and gas, gallium arsenide. And silicon carbide has a very high dielectric strength and it also has a very high thermal conductivity. So if you have a GAN on silicon carbide, you get the best of both. You get high electron mobility, high speed communication on GAN side and high power and high dielectric strength on silicon carbide. So that is the fundamental research that is coming with uh, lots of application into microwave power application. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. I, I, because uh, well, we had some interaction with a, a, a Korean Ceramic Research Institute. There they have this uh, uh, silicon carbide, large silicon carbide furnaces and all. So they make the silicon carbide single crystals and making use for this high power microwave amplifiers and all yeah uh, what are the uh, tools you are using for the simulation part hfss you are using or some other software we have, like uh, yeah, studio so and circuit simulator so uh, we do both circuit design and uh, you know package simulation system simulation so um, HFSS is widely used for electromagnetic field solver, but on the circuit side, if you are designing RF circuit, RF ICs, millimeter wave ICs, uh, we use uh, uh, ADS analog design system tool. Okay. Um, and uh, for high speed digital, because uh, in the past it used to be digital and RF, they were two different things. Now digital and RF, they are all merging, right? Because you know, processor, processors are gigahertz processors today, right? In laptop, uh, no more megahertz. So I think the high speed design, digital design is also beginning to use at Spice and some of the RF simulation tools. Okay. So uh, one more question, sir. Before fabricating these antennas, uh, how do you characterize uh, these materials? Uh, for, for example, the dielectric constant and the dielectric lows at these high frequencies. 
Yeah. So um, we we have a, a sort of uh, why I'm pausing is because we are patterning something. So. Oh. Okay. Uh, okay. Then then yeah. it is okay. No, I I can. I think uh, probably in a month or so we will publish. Then I can give you some data on that. Okay. But, but it is an innovative way of uh, it, it's uh, a non-contact optical beams. Okay. Uh, because you you have to characterize because as you go in for these high frequencies, Doctor Subodh, you will figure out it will become the media will become very lossy. Yes. Right. And um, ideally, you can do this in air because of dielectric constant one. Right, so we uh, we are figuring out something with a optical resonator type of thing, which is a free space uh, method, and I'll be able to share once we publish that. Is that okay? Okay, it's fine. So uh, it's a broadband or a single frequency? Broadband. Broadband. Okay. Okay, sir. Fine. Fine. Anybody else has any other questions? I think it's Can about 12 email? there. 12 there. Yeah, it's, uh, so I will send a mail regarding that. Say, I will send a mail regarding that. And once your convenience is got. Actually, the no, problem no, is uh, today's any... class is not by hours. It is extra departmental. So it's every day, Wednesday, 11.30, it will start. So that's why I actually forgot before fixing the 20th. It was Wednesday. So normally, the, you know, the new semester and uh, uh, the... The geology teacher, he, he has come. That's why. I'm really sorry for the inconvenience, but uh, we will schedule another day, one hour. Yeah, no no problem. We can uh, have another one hour session uh, with the interaction with your master students. Yes. Now, yes. now actually, I'm physically on January 20th because now it's 12 midnight pass. Now it is okay. January 20th. Okay. Here. <laughs> now I can say good morning. Okay, okay. Okay, sir. Thank you so much because. Uh, Mahadev, sir, else. you know, uh, uh, Professor Manoj Franklin, Arunda sir's son, working in Maryland University. Uh, I I know uh, Professor Manoj Franklin. I I did not know that he is in University of Maryland. When you mentioned that name, uh -huh. um, I remember Dr. Arunda sir told me that my son's name is Manoj Franklin. That is all I know. I I didn't know that he is in Maryland. Ah, he is there. Maryland and his wife uh, did research with me. <laughs> yeah, I will connect. I will try to connect with uh, Dr. Franklin and uh, introduce myself as uh, Dr. Arunda's student. Ah, okay. <laughs> and exactly uh, from Kotem, which place location? Your, your house? My house in Kottayam is very close to the temple. Hirnakara temple. Hirnakara, ah. I am from Changanur, right? I see. Kottayam, I know. Hirnakara is familiar. All right, so I will uh, connect with all of you sometime later. And thank then, uh, bye from me and thank you and namaskar thank to everybody. You, sir. Your family? Yeah, my family is with me here. Right. Yeah, working there? No? Yes, yes. I think my son has uh, become a doctor um, and my daughter is doing her degree. Okay. Sir, uh, one more. Also there in Texas, my PG classmate. I will uh, tell him about you. <laughs> then? My classmate, PG classmate is in Texas. I will tell him about you. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, just to keep in mind the one suggestion put forward by uh, uh, Rao, sir, regarding the experiments in applied electronics so please keep that in mind for the master students okay so what you are looking for is a sort of a project or um, it can be both ways uh, experimental or simulation um, 
since your expertise is in antenna, maybe uh, we should look for some antenna design and fabrication in the range of 90 to 140, but you may have some measurement difficulty. Yes, yes. Right? Where do you, where do you measure? VSSC may have some... Uh, VSSC measurement. is not approachable, sir. It's very hard. I know the person, my uh, senior is there, but it's very hard to get things done from there because they have uh, the secrecy and all uh, that's the thing i i don't think in india anywhere these um, high end uh, high frequency measurement is available i'm uh, i'm not sure but uh, samir uh, somebody uh, the um, samir or samir may right? have samir, samir may have right? yes that's true that's true samir chennai or samir uh, I Mumbai. Don't know where they are now but, uh, they will have it. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah. I will mail you regarding the other session. Okay. Yeah. Thank Take you. care. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye bye. Hope we will meet again for the alumni. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir.